Welcome back to the Milo Yiannopoulos Show. This week for episode 12, my guest is British writer, journalist and commentator Douglas Murray. Thank you for joining us, Douglas. Very good to be with you. So you were the director for the Centre of Social Cohesion from 2007 until 2011 in Britain, and you're currently the associate director of the Henry Jackson Society. Douglas appears regularly in British broadcast media commentating on uh, issues from a neoconservative standpoint, I think is the most common way you are characterized. And you're often critical of Islam. You write for Standpoint, uh, The Wall Street Journal, The Spectator. You're also the author of Neoconservatism, Why We Need It, which came out in 2005, and Bloody Sunday, uh, Truths, Lies, and the Savile Inquiry. Uh, I wanted to get you on the show this week because uh, I'm sitting here in a hotel room, a bad hotel room. I hate Hilton's. Don't you hate Hilton's? I'm sitting in, in Orlando in Florida where a Muslim gunman has just uh, executed 50 homosexuals in a nightclub and injured another 50. Barack Obama took to the air immediately afterwards and spoke more about gun control than he did about radical Islam, which is to say that he didn't mention radical Islam at all. Why is it that we're hearing so little from the liberal mainstream media about the real reasons for these sorts of crimes? Why do they keep making excuses? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, start by acknowledging, I mean, there's no way at this stage that Barack Obama and his administration can do a U-turn. I mean, uh, this could happen every day for the next few months, and they still wouldn't be able to admit uh, the problem because it's been a problem that they've been avoiding throughout both terms of his presidency. I mean, it's policy not to acknowledge this. You know, it's 2009, you'll remember the Fort Hood massacre, where 13 people were killed by Major Nidal Hassan, gunned them down whilst shouting Allahu Akbar, and who uh, had been in touch with major al-Qaeda figures. And the Obama administration, of course, famously concluded that that was a, a mere case of workplace violence. <laughs> uh, now, the thing is that this is not a one-off. Every single time there's been an Islamist terrorist attack, or thwarted attack, or attempted attack, during the Obama administration, this has been what they've been doing. But, I mean, you know, one has to be fair about this. His predecessor was also very, very cautious about this. People forget this, but, you know, George W. Bush was very wary about this whole territory. And, you know, you could say that there are reasons to be wary. Nobody wants to tar an entire community, etc., etc. But first thing President Bush did after 9-11 was to go to the Washington Islamic Center and read from the Quran and tell everyone how peaceful Islam is. So everybody has their own problems with this. Everyone's learning very slowly. Everyone's treading very, very carefully. The Obama administration just a few weeks ago released its new so-called countering violent extremism strategy, a very boring 12-page strategy with a sort of photograph of John Kerry at the opening of it. They really don't want you to read that, do they? No, I mean, also, well, except that John Kerry also looked vaguely stoned in the photograph. It was very strange. <laughs> totally blissed out for the last, <laughs> month, last months in office. But the American government's CVE, counter violent extremism strategy, makes not one mention of the word Islam or Islamist or Islamism or Islamic. It has no mention of Muslims. It is as if violent extremism is something that could come upon anyone at some point, And, you know, you're as likely to get it at your local Quaker meeting uh, hall as you might be down the local madrasa. In fact, a bit more likely, they think, at the Quaker <laughs> like meeting it's, hall. Like it's, it's as though it's a sort of common cold or the flu, you know? Yes. Um, radical extremist murderous tendencies could... could, could it could be you. <laughs> it could... Anyone, exactly. anyone. If you pass an Anglican church in, in England, you know, you're, you don't know how close you've come. I mean, you could have a, a thurible shoved into your hands by a high... <laughs> priest and shown shown how to wave incense at a terrifying speed um it, but the point is at this stage the obama administration cannot change this tune because they've been holding to this totally wrong idea for years and they couldn't possibly the only thing they could do now is to say we're sorry we got the entire thing wrong for the last seven years and i think they're very unlikely to do that isn't it slightly sad that they're more interested in saving face than telling people the truth? Uh, I mean, it's, uh, they're, they're, they are politicians, and I wish they realized how much more one respects someone when they say, OK, we got it wrong, or try. I mean, in, in Britain, David Cameron's government started off with all of this sort of religion of peace, nothing to do with Islam stuff, but actually, over years... Uh, they are now at a better place. They now don't come out after every terrorist attack and say it has nothing to do with Islam. In fact, they now say it obviously does have something to do with Islam. I mean, that's not exactly the whole way there. 
but it's a bit better. Uh, one just wishes that the Obama administration had the courage just to do that. It's weird, isn't it? Because in American media, it seems to be getting worse, not better. There's a woman, I don't know if you're familiar with the woman, Sally Cohn, who is a Jewish lesbian. Who Can I predict her politics? You, yeah, go for it. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you need to. <laughs> she, she responded, because of course she did, to the Orlando shooting by blaming Christianity and saying yeah. that right-wing Christians were far more uh, troublesome in her mind than the lovely moderate Muslims she knows. And yeah. all this sort of stuff, I mean, witless prattle, you know? <laughs> it's the, yeah, the most had, brainless... Dollar for every person who's messaged me in the last 48 hours saying, well, this is a video of, a, of an evangelical Christian preacher saying mean things about gays, and here's somebody who won't bake your wedding cake. <laughs> <laughs> but this is... Uh, this, this, these are people who are wasting a lot of their time, even before they're wasting mine. Anyone who's spent the last 48 hours desperately searching for homophobic Christian sermons has been wasting their life and everyone else's time. But it's so much more comfortable, you know, just sort of pretend that the current Pope, that Pope Francis, is as keen to throw gays off the top of St. Peter's in Rome as ISIS are in Raqqa. Just pretend it. <laughs> if you keep that pretense up for a little bit longer, maybe you won't have to look at the real issue. So I've got a theory that this is mainly driven by feminism because what they want is is lots of brown men with low standards who might actually have sex with them overrunning uh, you know the west. But I think there's probably more to it and you're the expert here. You deal with this kind of lunacy and insanity on a on a daily basis. Help me to understand. So we've spoken a bit about the the crazy positions that they hold, but help me to understand why does the left do this? Why are they making excuses for Islam and, and for uh, Islamic fundamentalism. What is it they're trying to get out of it? Well, every political denomination has their own problems with this. Uh, and much of it is for understandable reasons. But, I mean, everybody does. The right hasn't been very good on this either. I mean, you know, there are... Since this really kicked off, which I think most of us acknowledge probably started with the Satanic Verses affair in 1989, since then onwards, there's been a strong strain of conservatism that has, for instance, said, as Hugh Trevor Roper did of Salman Rushdie, that basically it's bad manners to be rude about Islam or to offend any Muslim. Yeah. And, and the implication being you sort of had it coming. Absolutely. And that has been a strong strain, and it's still a strain, and I still hear it up to this point. But it is undoubtedly by this stage not as strong as the denial that you rightly identify on the left and uh, come across all the time. And there are reasons for this. I mean, I just wrote a piece at National Review that went out this morning about why gays have been such slow learners about radical Islam. And one of the things, as you well know, is this totally misguided analysis of what society is this ultimate atomization of society into special interest minority communities. Uh, and this idea that, that all of the patchwork quilt minorities have more in common with each other than they do with the mythical, patriarchal, white, majority, straight, insert whatever you like into it. Th this idea was that all of the minorities had more in common with each other. So your politics as a gay man inevitably were the same as the politics of somebody in a wheelchair. This is what gives rise or, to the stupidest people on the planet, the queers yes. for Palestine. Well, I'm not bothered with them anymore because, I mean, they're a mono-generational oh, phenomenon. They're so great. They are the only people who give Sally Cohn a run for her money in the dumb stakes. The queers yeah. for Palestine, who, who just look at you blankly. I've met, I've met a couple of these guys at rallies. They look at you blankly if you point out that 96% of Palestinians believe that homosexuality is an unacceptable lifestyle choice. And they just say, oh, but, but we're oppressed. <laughs> <laughs> we're both oppressed. <laughs> And it's, uh, the best thing that anyone concerned with these people can do is to buy them one-way tickets to Gaza. And, right, right, and uh, just see how long it takes them. The Gaza branch of their organization. Right, and see how long it takes them to turn up in Tel Aviv, you know, begging for forgiveness. As a political <laughs> asylum seeker. Yeah, yeah, see how long it takes them to show up at the border with Israel saying, please, please, let me out. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the interesting thing is that these people have two 
ways of getting through the cognitive dissonance, which is obviously striking a lot of them at the moment. And that is the first thing they can do is that they can lie about Islam and what it is and what it means and what it says. And I mean, I just cited there was a piece in the Gay Times in London in January this year that uh, it was a textbook. I say it in my National Review piece. It was a textbook of just total lies and denial. Islam is not a problem for gays. There's nothing problematic with the texts. It's all fine. It's the problem of Islamophobes, really. So you can just lie <laughs> your way through this for a bit. But more common, I think, is people to fall back on this thing, which is more uh, certainly has been happening a lot since Orlando and the massacre there, which is to basically decide, if I have any hatred of anyone in my heart, then that hatred will be replicated across all mankind. Whereas if I manage to rid myself of any and all hatred, which some of us might describe oh. as discernment on occasion. <laughs> Having taste and standards. Myself, <laughs> if I rid myself of all of this, then everyone else will follow suit. And, you know, the problem is, is that your Jewish lesbian who wants to clear her heart of any hate may find that the big bearded anti-Semitic imam with the meat cleaver isn't on the same time track as her. Yeah, it doesn't quite have the same commitment to peace, love and understanding that she has on her Twitter feed. And in fact, is still relatively well committed to the project of ridding, <laughs> ridding communities of gays and, and, and uh, various other people that, uh, that, that Muslims don't like very much. I mean, the fact that Muslims don't like gays very much seems only to be a surprise to our media and politicians. It doesn't strike me as a particularly extraordinary insight, and it's not something that most people don't know. I mean, if you ask, <laughs> most people understand this. But then when they get their sort of, you know, when, when you put the cameras on, if you like, and their political correctness brain kicks in, they start doing the two things that you mentioned, the sort of the lying and the cognitive dissonance, and the, you know, hope beyond hope that saying the right things about peace, love and understanding will, uh, as you suggest, ripple out into the rest of the world somehow. Yeah, and these people are, I think, on a trajectory. I mean, I mean, I mean one can't always be too gloomy about this because I would say that it's now a one-directional travel. I don't speak to anybody who says, you know, I used to worry about radical Islam, but I don't anymore. I don't speak to anyone who says, you know what, I really woke up to this problem 10 years ago, but now I'm back to sleep. Yeah, yeah, who everybody is at least, at least so, static or moving in the right direction. Yeah, and how could they not? I mean, these are, one likes to think, if you write about events and write about politics and political ideas, you like to think that ideas change people, but they don't. <laughs> events change people. Yes. The best you can do with ideas is to make sure that some good ideas are there when people's opinions change. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. And interestingly, I've noticed in the wake of Orlando, I've noticed since that happened, gay people in America have started saying, well, I never thought I'd say this, but I'm sort of grudgingly thinking I might vote for Trump. I'm listening, and he seems to be the only person who's actually telling the truth about this. And I wonder whether one of the positive outcomes from this horrible attack might be the sort of smashing of manacles that have ideologically enslaved American homosexuality. And for gay people to realize actually the left doesn't have their back because it has put at the top of its victimhood hierarchy a minority that wants to kill everyone else on the list. And actually yeah. that it doesn't really serve their interests to put Hillary in the White House because she isn't going to help. Well, irrespective of American politics, this is a, this is a global phenomenon. It's absolutely fascinating because what I think a lot of people are slowly coming to realize is that the patchwork quilt, multiculti minorities against the rest thing. And of course, if you add up all the minorities, it turns out to be the majority. But anyway. The, 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 <laughs> well, you only need to get to women and you're done. You know? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Gosh. <laughs> Women do love it when they're described as a minority. Oh my it. good! They, do, you know, they. Well, we, I mean, we do, we can't we can't we can't generalize. We have to avoid any any accusations of sexism. But there is something about the female mind that loves it. They love it. <laughs> <laughs> you and I are freed from being polite about women, of course. <laughs> you know, we don't. We don't need. We don't. No, I mean, we don't. We don't need um, to flatter them. But this thing of, as I say, the, the multicultural minorities against everyone else worldview, 
it is definitely taking a battering at the moment. And I think that one of the things that's left behind as the tide goes out is the realization that people are making that it was always about politics from these people. It was never about sexuality. It yeah, was yeah, never yeah, yeah. really yeah. about race. It was yeah. only about politics. And, you, and it, it, they betray themselves sooner or later, don't they? Because you see in, in, look at the gay lobby, you know, the gay establishment, if you like, the magazines, Stonewall, Glad. You start to realize that when they run out of things to complain about, they sort of become ever more hysterical about ever tinier things oh, tinier and, things yeah and they start to acquire the grievances of other bits of the political left and gay people yes. are left on think well what's that got to do with aids or you yeah. know men's reproductive health or stamping out homophobia what are you doing like yeah. what why what is this why, about why would for instance why would being gay mean you're automatically in favor of a spendthrift government that's that borrowed beyond its means of course uh, it, it aren't gays in fact natural libertarians and you know gays are starting to wake up to this aren't they and and i think you know those those of us who've been on this on this train for a while are starting to become vindicated at the last election uh, I think, was it 50% of gay men told pollsters they were planning to vote conservative? And The Guardian reported this with horror because they had been bombarding these gays with intersectional, you know, far-left lunacy for so long. And they're like, well, how can these people not be on board with transgender pronouns and, yeah. you know, the, the racial grievances and race baiting and all of the other sort of pet projects of the left? How dare these homosexuals? We fought for these homosexuals' rights. How dare they be so ungrateful as to turn around and vote Tory? But, of course, yeah. many gay people People realise that, that are starting to realise that, that the left just simply doesn't act in their interests. I think I think that was that's been the case for a long time. I think as, as it were, quiet conservatives from minorities have been there for a long time. They're just getting a bit more voice uh, out there at the moment. Yeah. I think, by the way, just quickly going back to this thing you mentioned of the sort of established point of view on some of these things, it was very striking to me. Britain's most famous gay rights campaigner, Peter Tatchell, who's been right on many things over the years and wrong on many others. Peter Tatchell uh, did a typically right-wrong response to Orlando. He correctly identified the fact that the killer was Muslim mm. and that this might be part of the issue, uh, but went on to excoriate Marco Rubio uh, <laughs> for also being part of the problem. But, now, now, you and I know <laughs> Marco Rubio did not, at any point... Think of going into a gay nightclub and machine gunning people down. I don't think it's but ever it been on necessary Marco because of vir- for, for the purpose of virtue signaling. It was necessary for Peter to say, you know, the and Republicans also, are still evil. But you see, also because he said, you see, Marco Rubio has to take some responsibility because he wasn't on board with gay marriage. Well, you know, let me break news: Stonewall, the most the leading gay rights group in the UK, was not on board with gay marriage until just before it became legal in Britain. Right. So, a Stonewall and all those other queer LGBT activists who opposed gay marriage have they got any culpability for Orlando? Of course not. I mean, these are desperate flailings before recognizing and admitting to the real truth. Yeah, I find Peter Tatchell fascinating because he's gone on this, this journey in the last few years, which has made him a bit of a sort of quiet, conservative, a bit of a cult figure in, in my view. He's sort of gone on this, on this journey where he's now signing letters about the importance of free speech on college campuses, getting himself in trouble with trans campaigners. He's correctly identifying, as you say, the, the Islam problem, even if he you know, needs to do a bit of damage limitation at the end by reminding you know, all of his audience, yes, yes, Republicans are still evil. He has sort of done the thing that really mattered. You know, he has done the He's, he's performed the primary function of, of analysis, which is correctly identifying the players involved, which is more than most gay campaigners have proven themselves capable of. So I'm quite fond of him, actually. I think he's he's uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's a remarkable man. He's a remarkable man, and there are a few like that. As you say, I mean, it's heroic, really, to, for anyone who who realised this before everybody else did. This is clearly breaking down. In the same way that you you find fewer and fewer Jews, for instance who don't realize that this problem is is coming for them first. I think you'll find fewer and fewer gay people and others in the weeks and months ahead. Not making wild generalizations about Islam, so not hating all Muslims or any of the caricatures of it, but being very concerned for the first time that actually they've massively misread this situation. And, um, and perhaps that they've been lied to by the people that were supposed to have their backs, you know, left-wing politicians and, and, and lobby groups and charities. Yes, they were horribly lied to. And that lying, we shouldn't forget, is still going on. There is still a massive effort 
to diminish and downplay the motives of anyone who is of Muslim background and carries out a terrorist attack. It's so far in the last 24 hours alone, I've heard people claim that just because the Orlando terrorist went to a mosque doesn't mean he was a Muslim. Because <laughs> the, the dad said, oh, he wasn't very religious. My yes. first response to that wasn't, aha, it must be not Islam, but toxic masculinity responsible for this crime. Yeah. My response was, it, well, how much worse are the religious ones? <laughs> you know, if he wasn't particularly religious, how much worse are the ones who are going to the extremist mosques every week? Yes, it was like Pri- Private Eye had a, had a cartoon some years ago, a satirical magazine in the UK had a satirical uh, cartoon after uh, the... Danish cartoons protest. So they had a protest by uh, moderate Muslims holding up placards saying, kill some Jews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's the best Photoshop in history with the possible exception of Paris Hilton's uh, Stop Being Poor t-shirt. The best Photoshop in history, which is so sad that it isn't true. You know, behead those who call, uh, who call Islam violent. You know that one? Yeah. I, I, <laughs> there have been... There have been <laughs> posters i've seen and had way you have been very very close to that um, <laughs> but no, nothing's they, quite that no, uh, unself-aware. I would say it's, the, um, it's the great freedom of speech threat they always make which is say my religion is peaceful or i'll kill you this and w- after the break we're going to touch on this very briefly this is sort of sadiq khan's message isn't it you know be nicer to muslims or we're coming for you, <laughs> you know? after the break we'll carry on with this i want to also ask you about a tweet that has gone viral of yours about uh, british commentator owen jones and then we're going to talk briefly about american politics and the upcoming election which i'm sure you're going to have some strong views on uh, stay with us and we'll be back after these messages how would you like to get access to exclusive interviews from my iconic- names like Seth MacFarlane, Brian Cranston, Kevin Costner, Michael Moore, Seth Rogen, and many others. Are you kidding? Then you want to join Podcast One Premium. It's all available on demand right now exclusively at PodcastOne.com. Premium members have access to exclusive bonus content from hosts like Adam Carolla, Shaq, Nick Ritchie, and more. They also get to participate in giveaways and members-only community events. And that's not all. You can also blog with us and get your favorite star to answer your questions. Pretty cool, huh? And if you sign up for a two-year annual, we'll even buy you a $50 dinner. So join Podcast Podcast One Premium now at podcastone.com. It's the podcast with political analysis as rigorous as my daily hair care routine. Welcome back to the Milo Yiannopoulos Show on Podcast One. Welcome back. We were talking before we broke about the amusing signage, such as behead those who claim Islam is violent. And I noticed, uh, you know, you're, you're more in touch with this because I'm sort of gallivanting around America these days. And you are still in London. No, I hear. Yeah, still in <laughs> Londonistan, valiantly holding back the tide in, in Europe. You uh, over in London now have a, a Muslim mayor, and it seems to me that some of the slightly hysterical commentary about London having a Muslim mayor is, is unreasonable. He seems like a you know typical, slightly dim centre-left politician. It doesn't seem particularly harmless to me. But he did make a remark that struck a lot of American commentators as odd when he said something along the lines of, and you'll remember this better than me, he said something along the lines of, you know, if you don't stop being unpleasant to Muslims, bad things are going to happen, which sort of sounds a little like a veiled threat. I think it's a very complex subject, Sadiq Khan. You're right. I mean, there's been a lot of hysterical overreaction about it, you know, simply the fact that he's Muslim being used against him. But I mean, I think that I think that there were lots of questions and remain lots of questions about Sadiq Khan's judgment, his affiliations, his contacts. Uh, he wasn't merely a human rights lawyer for very bad Islamists for some years before he went into politics. He was an advocate for some of these people, a, a campaigner for them. So... When people said, well, the conservatives were racist and Islamophobic and even raising this. No, they would have and should have raised this about any candidate who had so consistently appeared alongside very bad people. So there is a question on Sadiq Khan's judgment. I think he's also he's a very canny politician. He knows where things are moving and is, is careful to straddle you know, public opinion. And so far, I mean, he has uh, pretty much uh, kept his head down on these issues. But, uh, but I have to say there have been some, some very uh, unnerving, I think, uh, developments. I, I, for one, am of the view that if he really wanted to unite Londoners, as it were, don't keep going on about your own identity. I don't like people going on about their own identity anyway. 
But I, I just sort of think, you know, either you're, you're British, you know, you're part of our country or, or, or you're not. I mean, once you're our mayor, you know, stop talking about my identity as, you know, you, you've got to unite a whole city. Yeah, speaking um, as a is the introdu- is a sort of introduction yeah, to a sentence that politicians should never really use. Yeah, and he, he's done it a lot. I mean, he's done it in the, I think, needless battles he's decided and, uh, to personally pick with the presumptive Republican candidate, Donald Trump. And I think that this isn't particularly helpful. I think that uh, there are all sorts of questions that Sadiq Khan needs to knuckle down and address. But uh, my own view is that this thing he did a few days ago, he said, you know, um, he did an interview in which he said, I, as a uh, Muslim am mayor of London, and this is a Western city, I am the West. And I think that kind Good of thing Lord. is, I think that kind of thing is wrong. It hits the wrong, uh, the wrong tone, you know, isn't it? The wrong tone. It, it sounds to my, my ear sort of unpleasantly hectoring and triumphalist. You see, I, I mean, I think that a, a country can be really proud of actually integrating people, but actually integrating people is quite different from just saying, you've totally changed, accept it. Yeah. And uh, I hear that a bit too much. But there's, And there yeah. is, you're right, there's something triumphalist about it and something slightly unpleasant about the way in which it's implicitly directed at let's say, the native population. Um, You know, it's sort of implicitly directed at people who are quite bewildered by how quickly their communities are changing. And who have some... The people we very unpleasantly call on both sides of the Atlantic, the so-called left behinds. Yeah, and they're the people who are reaching out to Trump, I think, in large numbers, people who, who haven't, in some cases, voted since the 70s, who have some perfectly respectable opinions about things, who are not bigoted, hateful people, but have some valid anxieties about the pace of change in their countries. And it does seem distasteful and slightly narcissistic and sociopathic to address those people implicitly in that way. I want to move on to a tweet of yours. Now, I'm, this is going to go on Friday, so the numbers may be slightly out of date on this. But at present viewing, it has 1,493 retweets and 2,634 likes, which is a lot for most people. It says the following, I'm sorry for Owen Jones. I would also feel guilty if I'd spent my life covering for the ideology that just killed 50 LGBT people. Now, for the benefit of those who don't know, um, Owen Jones is a slightly crackers, but quite sweet, far left commentator in the UK who finally has achieved a professional aspiration of all journalists, uh, Cracked America. But unfortunately for him, he's Cracked America with a viral video of him storming off uh, the set on Sky News. Tell us what happened. Yeah, this was on Sunday night, the night the news of the Orlando massacre was coming out. Uh, there's a paper review on Sky, and he was on it. And uh, it's sort of not a review of the papers, usually so much as a sort of opportunity for the contributors to vent their politics. He was very emotional, obviously. He had already sent out tweets saying, you know, I'm very emotional. This is going to be really hard, and so on. <laughs> of course, because, and, you know, the real victim it, in all of this is Owen Jones. Yeah, and uh, he then went on the program, and he... It was very strange. The presenter and the other guest, Julia Hartley Brewer, a conservative woman uh, of you know great distinction and, uh, and likability, was on, and he felt that they weren't paying enough attention to the homophobic nature of the Orlando massacre, and eventually stormed out. He did this uh, now, thing as well, didn't he? He said, "Speaking as a gay man, you don't understand because you're not gay." Like, and it, yeah. it, as the, it's this weird identitarianism that we touched on earlier in the conversation, as though you're incapable of understanding the facts of a case or of having right. human empathy and compassion and realizing the seriousness and the tragedy of a situation if you're not personally part of a group that it affected, which is the most sort of profoundly anti-intellectual and ridiculous claim, but a claim that seems to be accepted as fact by most of the media it's these very- days. It's very popular now, you know, I'm closer to it because... And it was a very interesting development, you see, because he was complaining that the media didn't have enough LGBT people coming on talking about Orlando, which may have been true in the case of the UK, but I don't think people were trying to just sort of get quotas or anything. But the the thing that struck me as interesting was his clear uh, upset at something which was quite hard to put your finger on. I mean, I mean it, you know, why storm out? It's my view that uh, he is probably on that learning curve I talked about earlier. He has spent his entire life covering for radical Islam as a journalist, insisting that really only Islamophobia is the problem. He's constantly derided anyone who's expressed any concern about this matter. 
So I think he's one of those people who um, he had a snapping moment, in my view, of reality catching up with him and his wrong interpretation of part of what's going on in the world at the moment. I think that's why he left. But, you know, there's an interesting development from this, which is that uh, after I sent out that tweet, I mean, I hate, so this is terribly self-referential, but bear with me for a second. Um, Channel right. this, is the, this is the Milo show. You can, uh, you can talk about yourself for as maybe, long as you like. Self, maybe we're <laughs> self-referential about you. Um, <laughs> no, but the, the, you know, the, uh, you're not speaking to a host with any, uh, any, <laughs> any qualms about this and no right whatsoever to, to, to tell you off <laughs> for being self-referential. I have no, no, uh, no problem with it. Go ahead. So, so anyway, the next day I, I was asked to, to go on Channel 4 News from Soho in London to talk, talk about the vigil that was going on there and to talk about Orlando and so on. It turned out that one of the other guests was Owen Jones. And I said, it's fine, you know, go ahead. And then I got a call saying, actually, uh, sorry, we can't have you on because Owen Jones won't appear alongside you. Mm. And uh, so I said, well, this is absolutely typical that somebody, it's what I said earlier, it's only ever really about politics with these people. That's all they're after in this. Yeah. And if they can use sexuality, they will. But here is a person who on Sunday complained there weren't enough LGBT voices. I happen to be gay, and I was asked on the program the next day, and he got me cancelled yeah. uh, because I'm the wrong type of gay. Uh, I'm, not yeah. the, I'm not the far-left Islamophobia is the main problem person. I'm somebody who for years has said... There is a real problem here and people need to wake up for, to it. And, you know, I mean, why would you the day after a massacre like that want to have a, a gay man who's warned about the problems of Islamism? So, yes, so, so there'll be a weird booking. Yeah, uh, this, um, this is, I think, characteristic. So it went ahead without me and was just, I think, the usual sort of supine, soupy, uh, meaningless, uh, let's all love one another and sing John Lennon's Imagine stuff. And... <laughs> I have very little sympathy for that because because um, <laughs> music it, ended in 1883 with the death of Wagner. Um, it's, <laughs> there is an argument, but I have little sympathy with it because I think it's too late in the day to wait for these people to all catch up with this, and it's too late in the day in all of our countries to respond to mass slaughter by like that guy who hauls his piano around European cities every time they're struck by a terrorist attack and plays John Lennon's Imagine. These are fundamentally unserious responses to serious atrocities by people with seriously bad intent. And I think it is it ill behoves a society that is adult and serious to respond to mass slaughter by teary, weepy, it's all about meism. I want to know what the problem is. I want to know what we do to stop it happening. I want there to be fewer massacres. It's very powerful, um, very powerfully said. Um, I think people will be... I have a lot of, of kind of quiet gay fans, people who can't really admit that they, that they listen to me and that they read me, but they're sort of... Uh, they're, 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 well, you see, they, they, they're... Um, so quiet about being fans of yours or quiet about being gay? Or no, both, quiet about right? being fans of mine. Being gay, coming out as gay was nothing compared to coming oh. out to their parents as a, as a Milo reader. That's the, that's the real... Uh, <laughs> that's the real brave life decision that they have ahead of them. You're no son of ours. <laughs> yeah, I could cope with the dick sucking, but Milo? Uh, yeah, no, um, that's that's, that's, they that's, bring around the local vicar to speak with them. <laughs> you see, let's, let's, it's a more sure, moderate form of homosexuality. I'm sure it's just a phase. We'll, we'll, go, we'll get him back onto Mark Stein soon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to ask you, um, before we wrap up, a few more general questions about the upcoming election. Are you a Trump supporter? I'm not. I'm not an anyone particularly oh, supporter. Oh, um, oh, uh, Douglas, you disappointed I'm, me. I'm certainly not a My Hillary supporter. I mean, everyone's got a view on Trump, so I, I, I don't air my own very much. I mean, my view is that his success obviously is a consequence of two terms of Obama and two terms before that of a Republican administration that did not deliver success, either in foreign policy or in economics. And people shouldn't berate people who are unhappy with those, uh, those previous administrations. I don't think that, that Donald Trump, to my mind, provides the answers that 
that might be needed, but I mean, he's certainly galvanized uh, parts of the debate. I think he's also coarsened the debate. But you're a bit but, more of a snob than me, aren't you? You sort of, uh, you you must find his populism a little bit distasteful. No, I don't. I don't, I don't like this term populism. No, I, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm. I think populism is is what has just become a euphemism for people who are popular, and politics is popular. I mean, what is wrong with populist politics? I mean, it's just politics that speaks to people's concerns that's that's fine with me i don't like politics that are about you know the uh, trade agreement deal between america and scandinavia and the, you know, I, most people aren't interested in that they're interested in the big issues clearly trump has responded to some of the big issues in a very important way and has fundamentally changed the debate but i really would caution at this stage that if he is going to be president or has any likelihood of being president, there needs to be a very great deal of fleshing out of real policy and how he's actually going to achieve it. Because I think the greatest letdown for America would be another you know, term of Hillary Clinton Obamaism. But a very great letdown for America as well would be after eight years of a Democrat president who overpromised wildly, who told the world and the American people that the, the seas would recede and all that stuff. I think it would be a great tragedy for the American people if as a response to that overpromise, they fell into the embrace of another person who overpromised and could not deliver either. So I just want a bit more what are you going to actually do ism. Yeah, I think that's reasonable, but I think Trump has started to um started to show signs he's willing to knuckle down in the last couple of months and started to give slightly more serious speeches, started to give more well-rounded answers to questions that go into a little bit more depth than previously. And, you know, there's some good signs. I mean, his list of um, potential Supreme Court nominees was very good and was, was sort of beyond reproach. I think most conservatives agreed. All right. Well, that's perfectly reasonable. Before I let you go, I want to ask you, I get asked all the time about Europe and Brexit. And I have to tell people and, and disappoint them very unsatisfactorily. I always have to tell them, I sort of don't know anymore. I don't really follow it. I don't pay attention. I feel instinctively as though Britain should leave the European Union because it seems to me to be a, a bad thing spiritually, culturally, economically. It's, we don't need to shackle ourselves to this doomed continent. But you're much better educated on these things and probably have a much stronger view. Give me, um, for American listeners who are um, sort of politically on our wavelength and who understand uh, and agree with us on most things, it, uh, give them a brief sort of uh, a little paragraph on why you believe as you believe. And then I'm going to ask you after that what you think is about to happen. Uh, I'm for leaving the EU. Um, I, I'm for leaving it for positive reasons. And I, I, I think we could be a lot better off. I think we'll be a lot happier as a country if we actually govern ourselves and our elections actually mean something. And there isn't a bureaucratic, unelected elite in Brussels who actually... Uh, controls everything that we can or cannot do uh, nationally as well as internationally. So I'm for leave. I know a lot of Americans from both sides, all sides, the American political spectrum, who believe that we should stay. And I always say to them that it is akin to um, a British person advocating that America should be part of an American continent-wide union in which Americans agreed that they would have taxes leveled from Canada laws drafted in Cuba and a justice system organized from Venezuela. Uh, <laughs> it would be intolerable to Americans, and I think it is intolerable for British people. It's, a, it's an insult to my mind that the mother of parliament in Westminster has become such a total backwater uh, that it basically isn't where the laws are made from, and it doesn't matter very much. And as a result, you get very low-grade people going into politics in the UK, um, uh, with some notable exceptions. Um, but I, I think that it's, um, it, it is a massive issue. I think if we do leave, we should wish the rest of the EU well, but I obviously, but um, it is, it's not for us. Um, and I think, by the way, there are two reasons why the EU itself is going to collapse at some point as an entity. The first is that the the fiscal union of the euro clearly doesn't work. It's repeatedly crashed the continent. 
and will keep on doing so because you simply cannot unite Greek ideas of debt with German ideas of debt and borrowing. <laughs> I know this from my own point. family with a Greek That's and a German a parent. And <laughs> one parent always <laughs> asked for the money back and the other didn't. <laughs> yeah, can you imagine? I mean, me, me asking a nice uh, a German uh, um, household if they wouldn't mind sharing their bank account with a family from Cyprus. <laughs> and you know you get the gravity of the situation so the first thing is the fiscal <laughs> union obviously didn't work and the second thing is the migration crisis angela merkel and the european commission last year set about absolutely destroying the continent of europe yeah. not the european union but the continent of europe the civilization of europe it is a generational catastrophe that they have unleashed and i hold them totally and wholly responsible and I do not want my country's future attached to an entity which is so suicidal and can go through such spasms of irrationality. Yeah, the, this sort of extraordinary opening of the borders to 1.4 million Syrian migrants that we know about in Germany. They're, so, so, they're not Syrians. They're not Syrians. But most of them, most of them are the EU the, the European Commission even admits now at least 60% of the people who arrived last year alone have, quote, no more right to be in Europe than anyone else in the rest of the world. Right. So that, that's a big cock-up. Yeah, right? um, indeed. And, and, this, and, and they're, of course, coming from a particular religious culture, and they're coming from a religious culture that doesn't treat women very well, doesn't treat gays very well, doesn't treat anybody outside its, its walls very well. And the, the sort of fundamental change to the fabric of German society you're starting to hear about now as people are getting a bit braver about speaking up. You hear these stories about you know, migrants striding into accident emergency, into the emergency room and refusing to be treated by female doctors and abusing and spitting on you know, female nurses and the, all this kind of stuff that is now a part of daily reality in Germany, in Germany, yes. of all places. I would, I mean, you know, we, we have in Europe, uh, to a less extent in America, but in Europe, massively overestimated our ability to assimilate people. If assimilation does happen, and I think it can, it happens incredibly slowly. It doesn't happen when you have migration at that at this speed with these types of migrants. I, I, I think that, you know, it's hard enough for a Brit going to America to become completely American. Uh, so I'm doing my how, best. <laughs> but so how, imagine how hard it is, uh, how infinitely harder it is if you're an Eritrean who ends up in Sweden. Yeah. How yeah. long is it going to take you to become Swedish? Yes. And of course they're not. Instead, Malmo is now, what is it, the rape capital of Europe? So we uh, Sweden, yeah, Sweden in general is. I was in Malmo a couple of days ago, and uh, yeah, it's uh, well. I mean, what happens is that the, the usual thing, you know, the uh, the Jews leave, uh, the gays bit by bit leave, the canaries in the mine make their noises, effectively, or, or try to alert people to the fact that there's a problem, die sometimes, yeah. and a lot of the rest of society goes on pretending that the dead canary doesn't mean anything and it's just fine staying in Perhaps this mind. Perhaps it's just sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great point you've made and one that I've, I've made in columns before as well uh, about gays and, and, and I think you're right that it's Jews too being canaries, canaries in the coal mine. Um, so that's something to take away with you if you've been enjoying this hour of radio. Treat Douglas and I as canaries in the coal mine. Listen to us because we see and I think gays, you know, um, very often uh, identify early threats not just to creative freedom and to freedom of expression but also to um coarsening and uh of, of society and to more to dangers on the horizon to you know to to uh, cultures and to atmospheres that are not uh conducive to or supportive of you know minorities and, and different ways of living so treat this america as a warning. Douglas Murray, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a fascinating conversation. Um, where should people go if they want to find out more about you or buy your books or read your columns? Where, where would you like to direct them to? They can uh, read my blog at thespectator.co.uk, which is uh, Britain's oldest uh, weekly magazine. It's and, the best magazine uh, in the English language, magazine. I think. And uh, at various other places. And I also, my, my e-book that was the best-selling book on Islam uh, since the Quran. Uh, um, <laughs> congratulations and, and, you've got, and you've got to give me some credit because Mohammed had uh, about 1400 years head start on me <laughs> that's quite a claim um, isn't it the best selling book on Islam since the Quran you should open with that, that's good, I like that the, 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 this, this book it has been unavailable for the last year or so, I finally finished an updated version which should be out next month it's called Islamophilia 
and uh, it's going to have 50% more Mohammed jokes than the last edition. So, Wonderful. Uh, well, I look forward to cowering in uh, uh, some sort of police protection with you when I'm sent back ah! to when I'm sent back to England by marauding jihadi homophobes in America, and we're both put into witness protection or some other such system designed. Well, give them to- hell in the meantime. Let, let us let us do so. I look forward to reading your Mohammed jokes. Um, keep up the good work, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much, Douglas, for joining us. Thank you.